If there's one yardstick by which most billionaires measure their success, it's their fleet of staff. Valets, butlers, people who could look after your wine cellar. It's as if they don't trust themselves to do it. And the prickly demands the super rich sometimes place on their staff are becoming ever more bizarre. We had the lady who wanted two, three hundred candles lit every night before she arrived. Like a sea of candles as she came in. You're asked to find and source first edition books signed by the authors from hundreds of years ago. One of our Saudi clients came to us asking for butlers for meerkat babies. I think it's all pretty bonkers. That's right. She said butlers for a meerkat sourced by a mere mortal. But cross your loyal staff at your peril, for with great servitude comes great power. Staff, once they've been with you for a long time, know where all the secrets are buried. And no amount of injunctions will ever truly shut them up. And if you can't trust some of your staff with your secrets, can you trust them with your priceless possessions? The bottom line is I have to put florals in this vase. You just told me it's a half a million pound. Whew. The mega wealthy outsource everything, including their children's future. The child was two years old, and they were in a complete crisis about what nursery school he should go to so he could eventually get to Harvard. It's a world where any and every whim can be gratified by the click of a finger. There's only one moment of that day when the billionaire's not being attended by somebody else, and that's when he's in the john. And if they don't want to see it all go down the pan, the super rich require super staff. This is the world of the billionaire, a land where too much is quite often not enough. To be merely big is banal to the super rich. Currently, the average billionaire is worth 1.79 billion pounds, has 350 million sitting pretty in cash, and four luxury mansions worldwide averaging 14 million pounds apiece. That's a lot of dusting. Mama, I'm a And there's problem number one for the ultra-wealthy. To maintain these palatial pads requires a small army. The super-rich have an inexhaustible appetite for staff. If you're very wealthy and you have five or six houses, it's like a company. There's the top person, which is usually like a house manager for all the houses. Then under him, there's a manager for each house. And then it goes down like that. That would include the chefs, the housekeepers, the drivers, any ground staff, any serving staff, pretty much everybody who would be involved in the smooth running of the home would be under that house manager's watchful eye. And in America, they say for every 5,000 square feet of home you have, you have to have one live-in person to take care of it. So if you've got, you know, a 30,000 square foot home, you've got six people, theoretically, living in your home, cleaning it and maintaining it and all those things. So I think the downsides to having a mega mansion is, you know, they're substantial. I remember sitting by a pool in some estate in Oxfordshire and this billionaire was on his Blackberry the whole time ordering canapes to be made by the cook, to be brought by the butler, to us by the pool. And actually, it just creates work for them in the end. It takes a great deal of effort, actually, to run all these houses and run these families. These people actually, effectively, run their houses like people run their businesses. Well, the recent trend is that you have to have an assistant for an assistant. So the housekeeper needs a personal PA. So if you think about the super rich having to manage all the staff to maintain the staff, they're actually creating a sort of living nightmare of stress for themselves without really knowing it. And for what? With servants snowballing out of control, the financial titans of London are having to turn to fixers like Sara Vestin Rahmani, director of a luxury recruitment agency. Hello, the Bespoke Bureau. Lucy speaking. How can I help? The uh, ultra-high net worth individuals are 
looking for special touches in everything they do. So they come to us with all sorts of weird and wonderful requests. Right now, I have one client. This particular super rich client is looking for an action butler. So it's somebody who will accompany him to um, rock climbing, adventurous sports like skydiving and extreme skiing off piste. Uh, but he also wants to take him raving because he likes elect electro music. If your billionaire friends don't share your hobbies, don't worry. You can always hire someone who does. One of our clients, she was a Middle Eastern principal, and she wanted to have a butler, confidant, who was a yoga instructor, could bake and do flower arranging. So, you know, at that instance, I'm going into the database and I find the female butlers and I say, do, do you do yoga? <laughs> yoga might be stretching things, but at least it's not, well, plain bonkers. We had a little bit of a challenge once when a very elderly lady in the Midlands rang in to say she wanted a butler who played the bagpipes. So the butler had to walk away from the house for half an hour in the morning from half past seven till eight. And then at eight o'clock he would play the bagpipes, walking slowly back to be under her bedroom window at half past eight, which would be her alarm clock, which is actually what I think happens to the Queen. And at Sarah's agency, the super rich frequently demand that all their family are treated like royalty. So we have an Arabic client who has just recently moved to London and um, he has left his wives, plural, behind him and has a new wife, a very beautiful and young Russian lady. But they have a chocolate Labrador who they have bought an apartment for. So he has his own pad. This dog has better house property than I do <laughs> and um, the dog needs a nanny his apartment's incredible and we, we did a site visit and um, beautiful flat screen TVs for the dog to watch during the day and um, yeah amazing river views and that's, that's the, <laughs> the life of the clients we deal with at the moment if the pampered pooches of the uber rich can expect riverside pads what are the billionaires expected to fork out for their staff the most important thing in the whole world is staff these days. They're the hardest thing to get. You've got to look after them. Quite right, too. The senior level private staff, house estate managers, butlers, personal assistants, for instance, um, it's not uncommon for them to be, their salaries to go into the six figures, 100,000, up to 200,000. So they, they can get treated very well. Don't ever underestimate staff quarters. That's seriously important. A friend of mine who lives in Eaton Square, he constantly gets letters. And the gist of the letter is, we're looking for somewhere to house our driver and our caretaker. And would you be prepared to sell the flat for our staff? This is quite extraordinary. These are flats worth 20 million, 15 million pounds. And they're being bought purely to house staff. And one reason staff are treated so well is because the super rich are terrified that at any time, the chef will spill the beans. The greatest source of fear amongst the rich is their staff. And they are paranoid, and they have every reason to be paranoid. Trust is hugely important. Staff, once they've been with you for a long time, know where all the secrets are buried. They are privy to everything, and no amount of injunctions or disclaimers will ever truly shut them up. So what do they do? They pay them more, and they pay them more. I don't understand why there aren't more secret diaries of the butler type books published, because my goodness, they've got such stories to tell. But every now and then, a billionaire does get burnt. Here are our top three exposés. At number three is a real page turner. Multi-millionaire art collector Charles Saatchi was left red-faced when his PA claimed he paid her to buy numerous copies of his book in a bid to make the best-seller list. At number two, Lady Gaga can't contain her poker face, furious at revelations by her former assistant that she was requested to share the same bed because the pop star hated sleeping alone. And at number one, the Queen is not amused after an undercover reporter posed as a royal footman and revealed that breakfast in the palace is like that in a caravan, with the royal cornflakes served from Tupperware containers. 
When you're super rich, it can really pay to vet your staff. Coming up, the pressure is on for billionaire children to make the grade. And when I said to the mother, look, realistically, Oxford and Cambridge are beyond his compass. She looks at me and goes, do they not take any account of breeding anymore? In school, being top of the rich list doesn't necessarily put you top of the class. My student didn't know what the words DIY stood for. And she was mortified to find out that it stands for do it yourself. And she was like, oh. In the billionaire's world, cash buys kudos. On the outside, every aspect of their life screams status and success. But often on the inside, there's a nagging awareness that the greater your wealth, the more you have to lose, and that the family legacy will one day rest on your darling little children. Their children are a reflection of themselves, and if their children aren't successful, then it somehow must mean that they're not successful. I have sat in a room with somebody who has got a personal worth well over £100 million, who is in tears because they worry about their, their child's future. I think that it's putting way too much pressure on young children. They're like, we really need the very best tutor who can help proofread this dissertation, because if I don't get a first, you know, I might not be able to get the job here or there, or no one in my family business is going to take me seriously. Failure is not an option. You have to be a galactic, you know, super achiever. The super rich, their worst nightmare is that their child simply lives off their achievements for the duration of their lives. The children are in another way. They can demonstrate their superiority to the rest of us. Everything has to be bigger, better, more successful. And the first measure of success for many children of the mega wealthy is to secure a place in the higher echelons of learning. And to do this, from the moment little Serge and Beatrix can walk, they must work. They're super rich. I outsource everything that normal parents do themselves, which extends to their children. So the children are overscheduled and tutored. They want their children to really get ahead of the game. They hire a night nanny, a day nanny. Then they'll also get the tutors. So, for example, the Mandarin tutor being a typical one because people want their children to learn Mandarin so that they're going to be ahead of the game in the Chinese market in the next 20, 30 years. I was at a smart lunch in Oxfordshire and suddenly a car drove up at 2 o'clock on the button. The children were taken away from the table to do Latin with the tutor that Roman Abramovich had used. So they didn't even get pudding. And they had to go off and sit in a, in a dark dining room and do, you know, Latin conjugations. The best story I heard was of a, of a, of a parent in Hampstead summoning one of the heads of these tutorial agencies, you know, on a Sunday night, urgent, and he assumed that they were sitting the exam the next day, and he arrived, and the child was two years old. And they were in a complete crisis about what nursery school he should go to so he could eventually get to Harvard. That's how absurd this, this is. The super-rich desperately hope that tutoring their spawn from first steps to kindergarten will secure that cherished place at Harvard or Cambridge. In the old days, in the 50s and 60s and maybe the 70s, if you were wealthy enough, if you made a nice chunky donation to the school or the college or the university, you could buy your way in, so it didn't really matter. But now that era is gone. So the rich are having to fight harder and harder to maintain this privilege, which many of them think is their God-given right. This extreme pressure has led to the rise of the super tutor, a modern-day superhero who swoops in to pour Pythagoras into the privileged. A super tutor is someone that has a proven track record of taking a student who is struggling. For example, I had a student who was sat on three U's, and in five weeks I got them from three U's to three C's. Now, that's, I'm quite proud of that, because that was nothing short of a miracle. And such is the demand for the super tutor that it's become astonishingly big business. In the UK alone, private tutoring is now a £6 billion a year industry with desperate parents offering huge wads of folding incentive. It can get very expensive. In some circumstances, there's, you know, bidding wars for the very best tutors. There are a tiny, tiny minority of super tutors who earn enough whereby they can only work for the super rich, and they will charge two, three, four hundred pounds an hour. And they're like, no, I like this tutor, I want this tutor. And we're like, she's full, you can't have this tutor. And then they come back to us and say, listen, I'll pay double the rate. 
Some people have been given watches, pens with their names engraved in. Female tutors have had handbags, sort of Uber handbags, all that kind of thing. Sometimes people are paying really top dollar for their tutor. In the world of the super tutor, classrooms are swapped for country retreats, philosophy is taught on private jets, and mathematics, well, that's all at sea. 27-year-old super tutor Phineas Pett has just returned from teaching two young children on a private yacht in the French Riviera. Parents would often go off, they'd go to restaurants or go shopping, and whilst I was teaching the children for eight hours a day, they had one friend over for half an hour on the whole of the seven weeks. They sort of had a play and stuff like that, and then, and then the sort of the parents wrapped it up and had to go back to lessons. And in many cases, the young heirs of the super-rich come pre-programmed with an eccentric knowledge base of their own. The oldest one said to me, Finn, at school, none of my friends, like, know, like, Louis Vuitton or, like, Hermes or Chanel. They've never heard of any of these brands. And I said, well, that's because they're normal children. Like, they're 11. And he was like, I know, but it's just really weird. My children were obsessed by Abramovich. We even did a sort of slow sail by Eclipse, which is his huge yacht. Kind of bizarre, because I remember sort of saying, oh, hang on, are we going back into port? So, oh, no, no, we're just going to have a look around just in case there's any other boats that we know, or actually maybe the ones that we like the look of and we might buy in the future. And I was like, right, thank you, 11-year-old, for telling me that. Another super tutor boarding the brain train is Cambridge Classics graduate Tara Crabb. She's been lured to New York by an offer she simply couldn't resist. So my tutoring job came through a week ago. I guess you would classify him as super rich because his parents are setting me up with an apartment in Manhattan, which is very close to where he is, covering my expenses to fly home whenever I need to and putting me on a salary, which is really competitive. It's as much as I would be earning for my age in the city a year, and that's just for tutoring for two hours a day. The last time I had an offer like this, it was to be based in Pakistan. It was in the region of the tens of thousands to spend a few weeks in Pakistan. The pay was wonderful, but they said that they would also be supplying bulletproof cars. And obviously I was... <laughs> I, um, I turned it down. Desperate to secure their riches and the family name, many billionaires are also not averse to shoving their little ones size threes through every possible door. So in the summers, they go to museums, they go to plays, they go to football games, but when they go to football games, they go behind the scenes and they meet the football players. They go to the World Cup. So when they are interviewed for their public school two months later and they say, well, how did you spend the summer? Out comes these wonderful stories of how I looked at the Klimt exhibit and it reminded me of my recent visit to Vienna. But worryingly often, even the riches of Croesus sometimes prove futile in furnishing little Evgeny with any grip of the classics. I've often had children who will write an essay about caviar or endless holidays in Monte Carlo or yachts. Imagine if you are a GCSE examiner and the last thing you wanted to read about is some annoying child who's literally spelling the word privileged all over their paper. I think the worst thing that's ever been said to me is I was called a peasant. Um, I mean, I wasn't really sure what to say to that. He was determined that, that I was a peasant because um, I earned less than his family. I did have this one girl who was at dissertation level, and we had this session, and she just turned to me and went, what, so you mean you're not actually going to write it for me? She was adamant that we'd been building up to this stage so that I could write it for her. And, I, I mean, obviously, there are tutors that do that. And that's what the rich truly believe, that somehow they can always get around the rules. And to a certain extent, I, I, I think it is true that they do, but there are times in which your child just isn't smart enough. And then they have to, and they have to live with that. Coming up, to the billionaire, it's not just their treasured children who are closely guarded, but their actual treasures, too. They must risk it all by putting their prized possessions in the hands of their staff. The bottom line is I have to put florals in this vase. You just told me it's a half a million pounds. Whew.
For the everyday run-of-the-mill billionaire, the battle to keep up with the Abramoviches is fought on an epic scale. The number of domestic staff is seen as a barometer of success, and it's spiraling out of control. According to the International Guild of Professional Butlers, in the 1980s there were around 100 butlers employed in Britain. Today, there are over 10,000. They're calling this the Downton Effect, with the new moneyed elite desperate to live like their well-heeled predecessors. I edited The Lady, and the classified ads were a real eye-opener, because you realized that the upstairs-downstairs world was not just alive and kicking, it was thriving. There were still ads saying things like, the Duchess of Bedford seeks ladies' maid, as if it was Downton Abbey. We're living in a financial golden age, which in many ways has comparisons with the great Edwardian Victorian age, one of the biggest trends. It is the extraordinary numbers of staff that people will have. The demand that is out there for butlers, chefs, people who can come and polish your classic car collection, open the front door, all these things. And that's simply what it is. If you have then bought a 10-bedroom stately pile, you are going to need people to help run it. It's an accessory to that lifestyle that you've chosen to live. A lot of people are buying, say, a 5,000-acre estate to do some shooting or something. That's quadrupled. But this invasion of city boys playing weekend squires is breeding resentment in staff quarters. There is old money, money that people have, in, have always had. So they're used to staff, they're used to their buildings, they're used to their palaces. They have a way of being that's gone through the generations and nothing changes. There's a sort of resentment towards people who have made their own money. It's quite hard taking orders from someone who you feel is a self-made nouveau arriviste. The nouveau riche will come for the weekend and then they bring all their family with them and friends. They might have the full house for three days, non-stop, mad. People would arrive straight onto the shoots. It's amazing. They just don't stop drinking, don't stop shooting. It's quite crazy. It's not just a home, but it is also a venue. Visiting VIPs, celebrities, dignitaries, royalty, world leaders. world leaders indeed, yeah. A private household is often run like a five-star boutique hotel. It has the same standards that are required there in terms of, let's say, fresh flowers, fresh food, and top-range service. The standards are impeccable. For those who demand the more fragrant side of frippery, candle artisan Rachel Vosper will create bespoke aromas for their homes. We recently filled um, three Baccarat crystal bowls which have been flown over from New York by First Class and they were filled on our table in Belgravia and flown back by private jet. Their imagination goes wild and, you know, money is no object. If I'm fragrancing a six-storey townhouse, we will very often have a different fragrance on each floor. So as you ascend through the house, you get a different um, sensory experience. One member of staff or two members of staff are very often employed to look after the candles in the house, which involves trimming the wicks every four hours and actually replacing the candles every four hours so they don't get too hot. We had the lady who wanted two or three hundred candles lit every night before she arrived. The driver would alert the staff and then they'd have to light all of the candles from the drive right up into the house, right up into the bedrooms. Like a sea of candles as she came in, that's how she wanted it every night on arrival and that's how it had to be. What we consider as a luxury item, like good wine, beautiful florals in your house, they consider as a part of their everyday way of life. I had somebody who had a house, you know, out of the country, and we used to do weekly florals at, you know, upper several thousands of pounds, and they were never even at the house. At all times, these ghost mansions must be primed like a hotel, ready for the billionaire to check in at a moment's notice, and that also applies to their dormant private jets and super yachts. When I was on the private yacht, we'd spend time getting ready for the clients, the principal, to arrive and the family, and then they change their mind. So if you'd spent a week polishing everything, and then they say, oh, they're not coming till Friday, or then they're not coming, and then they wouldn't come at all. 
The average billionaire spends 13 million pounds on mega yachts for what is essentially a wondrous floating weekend caravan. And with hundreds of these remaining fully staffed but completely unused for months on end, the marina in San Tropez has become one of the world's most glamorous caravan parks. The easiest thing is to buy a yacht. The hardest thing is to run a yacht. So you need a good captain and you need good crew. With 20 years as chief steward to the most perfectionist of seafarers, Terry Gilmore is ideally placed to train new recruits in the ways of billionaire service. OK, so what kind of world is this? One minute you could be cleaning toilets, the next minute you could be having cocktails in Capri. One minute you could do a very, very good job for the owner, and one minute you don't know what you've done wrong. The little details are all very important. If I go to Charlie, number one, he's got his sunglasses on. Number two, he hasn't shaven for a couple of days. That has to come off. And number three, we have to make his hair look correct to work on the interior of a yacht. One of the larger super yachts that are out here nowadays of about anything between 90 and 120 metres, um, they could have up to 50 crew, 50, 60 or 70 crew. It's like running a, a small hotel floating out in the oceans. That's not acceptable. This has to go here. These have to go here. It's like going to the theatre. We have to act. We have to make the food look wonderful for them. The presentation is good. The plate looks good. The wine is served correctly. And the whole thing works like clockwork. Sounds reasonable enough, so what could go wrong? Well, pack your trunks, because when needs must, the super-rich occasionally have no qualms throwing their staff right in at the deep end, literally. One family, they were out at sea, and Madame suddenly decided that she wanted to go for a swim. So one of the stewardesses spotted jellyfish in the water, and she got one of the other stewardesses to jump in in front of Madame. They got stung to bits, didn't complain, just to make sure that Madame could go for a lovely little swim. And if you think Madame is asking a little much of her man Friday, well, up on the ski slopes, the uber-rich are taking their demands to whole new heights. I heard a wonderful story of a billionaire skiing in, in North America where the individual had returned home after a day skiing with his family and couldn't find the keys to his Range Rover uh, and had dropped them in seven foot of snow. He called the concierge company. The concierge company got a helicopter with a, an extended magnet like they do to pick up cars in scrap heaps and flew that around the property until the keys flew up from out the snow with the metal key ring and hit the, hit the magnet. Uh, so that's kind of expecting, expecting the best and getting the service that you require. It's obvious that billionaires are buying themselves unparalleled levels of service, staff with grin and bear it ability. No task is too trying. Here are our top three outlandish staff jobs of the rich and shameless. At number three, it's the extreme concierge service. Your wish is their command. Previous requests include securing dinner reservations for two on an iceberg, where at least the locals are already dressed as butlers. At number two, it's Factor 50 Fonsworth Bentley, employed by rapper P. Diddy. His job? Sun technician. This chap's a high-end professional parasol holder. At number one, and you won't find them on the comparison websites, it's your own personal insurance SWAT team. They like nothing more than to swoop in and sweep up the priceless art collections of the mega-rich in case of flood or fire. In the world of the billionaire, mansions are not just their occasional homes, but veritable treasure troves, bristling with gold and antiquity. And this creates a headache of its own, because every day the hyper-rich must risk it all by putting these precious artifacts in the twitching, nervous hands of their staff. You're not working with kind of the everyday genre vases or containers or items. With the ultra-rich, now what you're dealing with is you're dealing with people who are antique collectors, art collectors, furniture collectors. Their expectations are that people will know how to look after lovely things and do it properly and professionally. I feel for some of those guys, you know, the butlers and the waitstaff that literally are putting crystal 
containers and glasses and wine glasses and silverware on tables. And then, you know, I come trudging in with my floral arrangement that's like that big and then trying to place it on the table. They're looking at me like, I'm in that case. I go, no, I'm really going to do this. Don't worry, <laughs> you know. I once went to work in a house where there was a gold staircase. And there was a lovely cleaner cleaning the staircase with a sort of scrub it pad. And actually, the scrub it pad had more gold on it than the stairs that she was cleaning by the time she had finished doing one tread. And when it comes to the burgeoning art collections of the mega rich, these opulent objects can be worth tens of millions of pounds. Luckily for all, they are lovingly tended by specialist teams of their very own. The super wealthy individual or family will generally have an art advisor or art curator. A curator can both mould the taste of an individual to a certain extent to advise on what he or she should be buying or what that family should be buying, um, uh, both in terms of as assets um, and in terms of, of building a collection. So by using curators, the super wealthy can educate themselves and show others their sophisticated level of taste. And spare a thought for the billionaire art collectors. They do say beauty is in the eye of the beholder and sometimes their staff aren't quite beholding at the same level. There's a dreadful story about the cleaner who took the moon off a, a wonderful art piece of art. She'd left her glasses at home, arrived at work, knew there'd been a party the night before, looked at the picture, saw there was a m white mark on it and thought it was something had been splashed, got rid of the white mark, in so doing removed the moon, and the picture went from millions of pounds worth of value to I don't know what. Coming up. The super-rich are the new celebrities, and under paparazzi pressure, they hire staff to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars to make them look a million. They know they might be shot somewhere in a photograph or a magazine, so they want to look good, whether it's with colonic hydrotherapy, acupuncture, and non-surgical fat freezing. Which obviously is a luxury way of suffering, but nonetheless, it is a form of suffering for them. Suffering? Who wouldn't want to be a billionaire? In London's platinum triangle of Mayfair, Belgravia and Knightsbridge, the wives of Russian oligarchs and Arab petro-billionaires are having to hire extra staff to help them deal with the unique demands that come with a life of luxury. Originally from Egypt, Maureen Tadros now runs a bespoke concierge service to help newly arrived women of wealth adapt to the mean streets of London society. What a girl wants. <laughs> I know, they're so cool. They actually really suit you. Oh my god, you look so stunning. It wants to concentrate a little bit more on helping ladies, specifically ladies who have relocated from the Middle East and from Russia. We have a lifestyle department that helps ladies you know, source bags they can't get hold of, get into VIP events that are sold out or that they just couldn't get tickets to. We create very bespoken luxury experiences at events like London Fashion Week. Or, you know, we can do everything from closing off parts and you know bringing them couture designers we look after their restaurant bookings and the restaurants are fully booked their travel we look after everything in their lives Maureen understands exactly how her clients operate their intricate needs and the extreme expectations that they bring yes yeah, so it's pretty hard when you first move here I think so if you were at the supermarket in the Middle East, somebody would pop all of everything onto the, onto the conveyor belt for you. Somebody would then pack your bags. Somebody else would then carry the bags out to the car. Um, your driver would then drive you home. Your porter would then take it upstairs and your cleaner would then put it away. So at no point after you've paid for your shopping do you ever touch it. I have never even switched on the washing machine since the day I was born. Never ironed it, I think. I was never hoovered, actually. Yeah, those three things I've never done. Even washing your own hair, it's not something that I do, and most Middle Eastern ladies don't, like, you just don't do it. It's not a luxury, it's a necessity. And there it is in a nutshell. Our luxuries are their necessities. And why? Well, because some billionaires believe the whole world is watching them. People use the super-riches as escapism because it's a voyeuristic world we live in. Everything is monitored. They're under pressure to look good. It's part of their image. It's part of their brand. It's part of who they are. So it's 
like your wedding day every single day of the week. There seems to be a new group of billionaires that have PR agents and staff and people that are courting the media so they can be on the covers of magazines and newspapers. And when it comes to their own appearance, they'll have personal shoppers or beauticians and facialists and hairdressers and stylists and wardrobe managers and so on and so on and so on. It's also a way of, don't forget, of filling up the day. Millions spent on minions. That's what it takes to transform the uber-rich into the show-stopping socialites that society demands. And to paint on that smile, they call on their private makeup artists. Charlotte Cave is a regular visitor to the mansions of the super-rich, and it's important that she takes in her surroundings. Can't always do people's makeup how you would choose, because there is a taste issue. When I go into a household, I have to take in everything, what I see, and then read their style before I've even got to them. I can see by the chairs they have around them what kind of person they are. Are you a wingback designer's guild? Is it fully and feminine? Or are you an Eames chair? Is it controlled from their hair and makeup? You can pretty much guess how people live. But unlike their powdered cheeks, life for the billionaire isn't always rosy. Don't be mistaken that you know the ins and outs of what goes on in a 500 million pound household. Sometimes you are exposed to some domestic scenes that you probably wish you weren't exposed to. Like, I've had people throw up on my lap before, that's not great. <laughs> I have seen people drunk. I have seen people cry. It's really stressful. And to turn that frown upside down, or sideways, or wherever they want it, the super-rich pay top dollar to their personal cosmetic surgeon. We get people who are getting into the cars in the morning, or opening a, a compact and looking at their faces, and we do get emergency Botox calls. We, we get some females who come in, and their mothers have actually brought them in their 20s to the surgeons and said, you're going to start having Botox now. With a face full of Botox, these rich 20-year-olds won't be showing any displeasure. And as they're all on a family day out, the mums also book themselves in for a midlife MOT. We'll work all the toxins out, whether it's with colonic hydrotherapy, we get them in for some acupuncture if they're really stressed. We do cryogenic lipolysis as well, and that's non-surgical fat freezing. What happens is the fat is suctioned up, and two metal plates freeze the fat down to about minus five, so the fat cells die. So four to six weeks later, the toxins are removed from the body. And they pay for this, let's remember, wonderfully. And as always, in the insatiable world of billionaire one-upmanship, there's even one client that's taken her personal grooming to a level that is quite simply fabulous. Well, I have one lady who didn't like straighteners for her hair. So every morning, the ironing board was put up in her dressing room, and two pieces of brown paper were put on the ironing board. It was at a low height and the client lay back on a sort of reclining chair with her hair on the ironing board between the two pieces of brown paper and was gently ironed by the housekeeper as the first job of the day. Um, that's a little bit unusual. Well, I know that a lot of these women suffer, which obviously is a luxury way of suffering, but nonetheless, it's there is a, it is a form of suffering for them. But actually, it, it doesn't change how you feel inside to try and maintain their youth, because you end up looking at the things that are wrong with you rather than focusing on the things that are right with you. We imagine if you're very wealthy, you're very secure about who you are. But most people are very insecure about who they are or what they look like. And it makes not the jot of difference, from what I can see, whether you're very rich or just normal. If it's a social event, you certainly will have you know, the first wives with the younger wives, and I think sometimes there's a social pressure. If you're slightly older, you're going to feel more pressure to look good, because you might be standing beside a 20-year-old. Women in particular put way, way too much pressure on themselves. However many people you have around you telling you're beautiful, wonderful, successful or whatever, unless you feel it, it doesn't make a jot of difference. 
So just, I think the problems get bigger, not smaller, if you're very wealthy. So, with every need attended to, are the very well off truly better off? I think it doesn't feel rewarding when you've spent a lot of time going out shopping and having lunches and dinners and coffees. When you haven't actually worked hard in the middle, it kind of just feels empty. If you've got a huge staff who are going to pamper you and, and they're going to provide you your food, they're going to clean your clothes, they're going to wash your floors, to a certain extent you become a bit redundant in your own home. I think having a lot of staff just breeds paranoia after a while because now staff run you. You can end up with this sense of helplessness if we're sitting around waiting for other people to do things for us. Actually, our, our self-esteem actually lessens. We may give a sense of being high status, but we, we tend to actually internally feel less. The accretion of staff mirrors the accretion of things, and actually it just creates work for them in the end. I don't think I've met a single person who works for a very, very rich person who's happy. I'm waiting for the confessions of a tutor. I mean, that's, that's the next bestseller. 